Hello, fans of Cheese of Ages. As my camera adjusts the lighting, we're here with yet another review of playtest materials that were released. Uh, it's not a full-fledged another wave, even though I call it the third wave of playtest materials, because they pretty much only added magic items to it. Nothing else was changed, even though several things about it needed to be adjusted, uh, which I might go over during this video because uh, otherwise it'd be a pretty short video. Uh, those things in quick summary are being the rogue needs a little bit of a tweaking because the stuff it got in the second playtest thing, making it more of a skill monkey, made it a little bit too much of a skill monkey in my opinion. Just needs a little bit of fine tuning. And also, I've spoken a lot about it, but the sorcerer as well needs some uh, drastic reworking. And a recent article from Wizards of the Coast says they're going to pretty much be scrapping the Dragon Bloodline that I've talked about a lot in these videos and making it a completely different class because basically they admitted that they screwed up and made something that wasn't actually a sorcerer. <laughs> uh, while I do support you know the Dragon Bloodline being kind of like a uh, a combat oriented sorcerer. It should have had like medium armor and like a claw attack or something, rather than like f put you in as a like a fully armed knight kind of thing. That's not very draconic. Full plate, a shield, and a sword isn't very, or like an axe isn't very draconic. <laughs> Being in like hides or scale armor and wielding you know, like natural claw attacks is more draconic, in my opinion. That's what I would have done to tweak it. But anyway, we're mainly here to review stuff that's in the new playtest materials which the only changes made in this uh, playtest packet is some of the monsters were tweaked, but I'm not going into that. Uh, we're talking about core rules here, not monsters. Uh, and magic items. Now, the most drastic change to magic items is uh, the fact that they're not part of your level progression anymore. For like 3rd and 4th uh, edition, they were pretty much uh, part of your character progression, you were assumed at certain points to get magic weapons and magic armor. And if you didn't, you were pretty much boned. You were a weaker, you were slightly too weak to handle situations, you were more mathematically up to par for how they made the system. You were designed to bl get magic gear as you leveled up. And at right now in the current D&D uh, &D Next, or 5th edition, or whatever you want to call it, materials, uh, treat magic items as like a big deal, uh, and finding one isn't part of your level progression, it's a big deal, and it's like entrenched in storyline. could be a, like a plot hook or something. They're a big deal, they're not something you find at the local corner store. It's like, hey, Ma and Pa at the uh, local uh, eatery, you got any magic sword? It's like, well, boy, how did Cletus, I got yourselves a plus one long sword of flaming. You know, here you go, I got like six of them in the back that I made up on my casual day off. It's not like that anymore. You find, you don't just, you know, stumble into a random freaking corner store and buy yourself a longsword. And they even fleshed out uh, backgrounds for magic items, giving like histories to random magic items. Uh, while DMs could always just come up with histories for magic items, uh, if you just use the random magic item rules and previous editions for like 3.0 and like 3.5 and 4th edition and you rolled for a random magic item you get, oh, plus one flaming longsword. But in this edition you don't just get a plus one flaming longsword. You get like a plus one flaming longsword that was forged in the abyss and uh, was forged for an, an evil warlord that was attempting to, t uh, to do some evil stuff and merely holding the weapon fills you with a sense of sorrow over the evil that was done with the weapon. You know, that's just a simple one flaming sword. <laughs> and of course, being fortunate in the abyss, it looks like an evil sword. It's a big deal, that plus one flaming sword. <laughs> uh, but you know, to demonstrate the kind of things you will, that, that was an actual, that flaming sword forged in the abyss was an actual thing I generated. But let's actually, during the video, take some time out and actually generate a random piece of equipment. We're going to generate some random plus one armor. 
Uh, okay, first off I need a D percentile, which are actually used in this edition, unlike 4th edition. So let's roll it up to see what type of armor the plus one armor is. I got a 19. That means it's a... It's a actually a rare one. It's plus one displacer beast hide armor. Let's go up to the traits, and let's use the full rules. Previously, full rules, uh, for like a plus one thing, that was as far as it got. You got, hey, plus one, this place or hide. That's as far as you got. But now, you can actually determine some history for the item. So I'm going to roll for creator now. Oh wait, I rolled poorly. I accidentally, I was supposed to roll the d20 for this. This needs some tweaking. You need, uh, to do this, you need, uh, they should modify it where it only uses one dice to generate mag random magic items. Every chart should use the same dice. So let's roll for the creator of this plus one displacer beast hide armor. This plus one displacer beast hide armor was forged by on the elemental plane of air by air elementals. Uh, it's lighter uh, being made of wispier materials and as tough as normal, but it has a lighter quality to it as it's infused with elemental air. Uh, next up, it, the nature of the item itself. And I have to switch dice again. As clunky as this is, I have to switch from a D percentile to determine the item to a D, for, uh, a D20 to discern who made it, and now to determine the nature of the item, I need a D8. Okay, it's an item of prophecy. Whoever bears the item is destined to play a key role in future events. You know, so already we've gotten plus one displacer hide beast armor made from displacer beasts from the elemental plane of air, so their height is lighter than normal, and it is mentioned in a prophecy of a great hero. Uh, minor properties of it. I gotta switch dice again. Back to a d20. A little clunky here. Uh, minor properties of the item. I rolled a one. <laughs> on command, this item is a beacon. Uh, on command, this item sheds bright light in a ten-foot radius sphere. Darkness within ten feet of the sphere of bright light becomes shadows. Uh, speaking of the command word again, douses the light. Uh, uh, so, there we go. It's got the shining light. Now, minor quirks. I don't have to actually ch change the dice this time, m amazingly enough, for the minor quirks. So let's roll that. Okay. Possessive. You, when you are acquire this item, you become... It demands you attune to it if you... if it has an attunement function, and does not allow the bearer to wail... to attune other items. Other items already attuned to the bearer remain so until their attunement ins and expires. And this is another thing. Uh, I'll go over in a minute. So yeah. So it's slightly intelligent and possessive of its wielder. So instead of just like pl random plus one uh, displacer beast hide armor, you've got uh, a plus one suit of hide armor forged from displacer beasts native to the elemental plane of air. And this armor was forged as part of a prophecy uh, that a hero would wield it and fulfill some. Uh, Role in events in the near future, and it radiates light upon command, and it is very possessive of the one that wields it, uh, gaining a bit of, bit of sentience. Perhaps it was slightly corrupted and has slightly p jealous, you know, possessive tendencies because of that. Maybe creation went slightly wrong. Those traits on just a random suit of armor that was generated randomly. That puts a heck of a lot of story to that important magic item that you happened to cross. Uh, let's generate another weapon. Let's generate a weapon now that you will come across. Uh, let's just generate a, a, a random plus one weapon. We're going to go have to go per back to percentiles to determine the type of weapon this is. Okay, so we're going to be making a magic crossbow. It's either light or heavy, doesn't matter. In this particular instance, let's just say it's a heavy crossbow. Who made this magical heavy crossbow? Well, of course you could totally skip this if you didn't want to have any history to the item. But let's go ahead and see who made this plus one crossbow. Eh. 
It was formed uh, a heavy crossbow forged on the elemental plane of Earth. That doesn't really make much sense. Let's reroll that. That's an option. Okay. It's a heavy crossbow forged by giants. Uh, let's see any properties. Uh, it's somewhat oversized, but still usable without penalty. Maybe it was a giant's hand crossbow. Uh, the nature of the item. Switching dies to a D8. And it's a religious icon of the giant culture that made it. It's dedicated to a god of giants and has holy symbols worked into it and followers of that god will attempt to reclaim the crossbow. Minor properties. Hmm, I rolled low again. Conscientious. Let's see if that makes any sense for the item. Uh, no, it doesn't make any sense for the item because it make it the giants made it, for crazy sake. Okay, Sentinel. Uh, mm. Hmm. Ah, it was forged to make. It was forged to slay enemies of the giants. Let's say it was forged to slay elves. No, dwarves. Let's say it was meant to. It was forged to slay dwarves. And the item will glow uh, when there's a dwarf within a hundred feet of it. And you know, like Sting from Lord of the Rings. Uh, yeah. And perhaps those dwarves will actually recognize the crossbow as a, you know, the hand crossbow of, like, giant assassins or something. Minor quirks of the item. Switching to a d20. Yeah, covetous. Other intelligence creatures that see this crossbow will desire it for themselves, although few will take action against you to, take, to claim it. So everybody will be jealous of this uh, giant crossbow uh, that slays dwarves. <laughs> that detects dwarves. Uh, anyway, also minor quirks of this item. No, I must have skipped something. No, I, okay. So it's a. I accidentally thought, assumed there was another thing, but it's actually not. Uh, so basically, we've generated a plus one magic crossbow. But this plus one magic crossbow happened to have been forged by giants, so it's a little oversized. Uh, it still functions normally. It's a religious icon of the god of giants and was forged to slay dwarves and warns you of the presence of dwarves. And also, people around you will really want that crossbow. And uh, giants will seek to proclaim that religious icon. So yeah, that will that crossbow will draw some attention to you. <laughs> and I imagine dwarves wouldn't like you too much if they saw that and recognized it. So that's a heck of a lot of storage, that random plus one heavy crossbow you, you came across in a chest. Or, you know in some far-off locale and uh, managed to find in a, you know, a abstract store, like the one or two magic items they have for sale. <laughs> Even though that's not really something, you're not supposed to be able to buy magic items too frequently in shops in this uh, particular edition. Anyway, another element to uh, magic items in the materials presented are attuned uh, magic items. Uh, some items have uh, special abilities that are unlocked by attunement, and there are variant rules to r uh, r cap your number of attunements that you can have. Like, you can only have like three or so, uh, or based on your charisma modifier, a uh, number of attuned magic items. Well, like just a plus one sword or something won't require you to attune it to get its full benefits. But, like, the more powerful magic items will require you to attune to them. Uh, and it requires you to basically grasp or wear the item and spend 10 minutes concentrating on it. Uh, depending on the item, the attunement process can change slightly, like meditation or prayers or something. And, you know, you have full access to the uh, attunement requiring abilities after this. Uh, and I can understand this, it adds some flavor to it. You gotta, like, bond yourself to the magic item to get to its full functions. And, of course, it balances out some items where, if they're particularly powerful, you can't just, like, oh, I only have one use of this a day. Uh, use it, swap out. Uh, like, uh, daily item powers in 4th edition, like, oh, I have a Helm of Heroes, and I grant somebody attack, 
I can use my daily iron power on this helmet to grant a full-fledged standard action instead. I can only do that once. Different helm. I can now do this. Instantaneously. <laughs> it keeps from that happening. So, uh, in order to like have a powerful item, you have to just stick with it. You have to take time to attune it. Uh, if it only has a daily effect, you can like take ten minutes to attune yourself to another item, so it doesn't completely omit it. But uh, it helps keep you from like having a suite of magical uh, things in one slot and just swapping them out you know, freely for powerful effects. Uh, let's try and like scale through these materials. That's not on screen, but I'm looking over the materials. Let's try and find out uh, some of these properties that are require attunement. I'm trying to find. Oh, here's one. Okay, let's look at the full-fledged weapon, uh, Defender. Okay, it's a Defender weapon. The broad blade of... Oh, it's a special greatsword. The uh, Defender. The broad blade of this greatsword is sharp near the tip and notched with defensive rills near the cross guard. An enameled shield design is blazoned at the base of the hilt over which is inset the symbol of a gauntlet. When the blade is handled, its balance seems to shift from moment to moment but not unpleasantly, but intuitively, to match the wielder's grip. It has no effect. I imagine it might be a plus one sword. It uh, doesn't really specify here. But if you're attuned to it, you can, can gain up to a plus three bonus on attack rolls and damage rolls you make with this great sword. At the start of each of your turn, you can decide how much of the bonus applies to your attack rolls and damage rolls. If you do not use the entire bonus, any remainder any remainder becomes a bonus to your AC that lasts until the start of your next turn. So yeah, that actually did include a bonus. Uh, so I imagine it's no, it has no effect at all if you do not attune yourself to it. But it can be a plus three greatsword, uh, or like a plus two that gives you a plus one to AC, or a plus one greatsword that gives you a plus two to AC, or just a greatsword that gives you a plus three to AC. So yeah, that is a pretty powerful ability. And considering it's a plus three great sword, you can move the enchantment around on. That can be pretty versatile. Uh, it's not into the, the scale of like, oh, I get this one-off deal and you know, chuck it kind of thing. Uh, here's something uh, that has properties without attunement. So dwarven thrower warhammer. Uh, it's a warhammer that's uh, you have to be a dwarf to attune to it, but it's a plus one. Warhammer and unattuned hands. If you're a dwarf and attuned to it, because you have to be a dwarf to attune to it, the Warhammer's bonus to attack and damage rolls becomes a plus three. So in dwarven hands, it's a plus three weapon. Also, you can th use it as a thrown weapon of, with a range of 20 to 80 feet. Uh, when you throw the weapon and hit, the target takes an additional 1d8 extra damage, 3d8 if it's a giant. And that's a very rare item. Uh, so yeah, you can see how this entombment mechanic is, can be used uh, for uh, enhancing flavors of items and like uh, bringing out the true power of a weapon. It's, it's flavorful. Uh, it should be fleshed out some more in the future. And of course, there's only like a handful of magic items presented in this new materials, but uh, I like the new mechanics. I really can't have very few things to say about it. Uh, that is a negative, uh, but it definitely needs fleshing out. Right now, the uh, abilities seem a bit narrow in focus. Uh, seems like generic enhancement to your attacking power uh, kind of thing. Well, there are some very rare items that are powerful and don't require attunement, like an oath bow, uh, which is reminiscent of the, like the third edition, uh, 3.5 edition oath though, where you can like swear an oath to slay your enemy and uh, make it a five equivalent, uh, give you a plus three to attack rolls and an extra 3d6 damage to the enemy on a hit, and they ignore all but total cover and don't suffer disadvantage from long range. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, if you've sworn an enemy. Any other attack you make against any other enemy suffers a disadvantage, uh, regardless of whether you use the bow for it or not. So yeah, <laughs> it's good, flavorful, and powerful. <laughs>
and very rare. <laughs> and if you're curious and don't have the playtest materials, Vorpal Swords are pretty bar, pretty boss. They're like a plus one uh, weapon, plus one bastard sword in this case. Uh, that if you attune yourself to it, the sword's bonus, the sword becomes a plus three weapon, and it ignores resistance to slashing damage. And when you crit with it, you make another attack roll against the same target. And if you hit again, it takes an the target takes an additional 6d8 damage. And if the second attack is a critical, if the second attack roll to make the extra damage is a critical hit as well, and the target has less than 151 hit points, I think 150 or lower, uh, you instantly kill the target. <laughs> Uh, if it's got a head, you chop it off. If it doesn't have a head, you cut it in half. <laughs> With the same lethal result. And then, but the rarity of that Vorpal weapon is a legendary. So you'll probably never find it unless it's at the crooks of a campaign. <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty flavorful and vorpal <laughs> Uh Yeah. Good, solid mechanics. And I've been ranting and actually supplying very few... Uh, very little information for the length of this video. Uh, but yeah, that small update there uh, about the magic items, and I approve of pretty much all of it. The attunements need to be fleshed out a little bit more, and uh, it seems like wasted potential to a small degree, where it's like, oh, attunement makes it more powerful. And you can go with this variant rule where you can only attune a certain amount of items. Uh, and it just seems like it's attunement should have something different to it. I'm not exactly sure what attunement should be fleshed out to have some more qualities to it. I don't know. It just seems like it should do something a little different besides give you a power boost, or like a crude power boost. Uh, maybe have some like uh, utilitarian gear would help out a bit with my particular uh, uh, f opinion on attunements. Uh, just having, like, oh, attuned to it to get brute force doesn't seem... Uh, or, like, brute defense it just doesn't really seem f uh, as fleshed out as it could be. I hope to see some uh, uh, utilitarian attuned items. Uh, yeah, attunement could be better. It's the only thing remotely negative I can say about things. Uh, but fleshing out the backgrounds of, uh, you know, an optional, like, uh, ability to easily, well, fairly easily generate a uh, nifty history for every single random magical item, and magical items being in a big deal rather than just something you find everywhere, you know, and is expected to come, uh, is nice, and, uh, well, it's nice. <laughs> uh, although it's kind of another element they took from the uh, Fantasy Flight games, and some other systems, I imagine. Uh, and Warhammer 40k, and, uh, yeah, Warhammer 40k games, uh, Power Armor has a, a, like, a random history you can roll to, like, flesh out the history of your Power Armor in, uh, you know, uh, Death Watch games, and, uh, f uh, Dark Crusade games. I mean, Black Crusade games. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, they... They probably saw that, or saw it in a different system that I'm not aware of, and decided, oh yeah, let's magic items should have like a, uh, a ability to give it extra properties based on its history. Now, uh, who made it should have an influence. You know, it should be able to easily randomly generate who made this magic item. You know, it, it shouldn't just be like generic plus one sword number 53. <laughs> I actually enjoy that to a degree. Anyway, this video is rambling on, as I've said before. So, I'm just going to go ahead and cut it here, uh, and say, hey, I approve. Uh, the generation system needs to be one dice only, and not switching to and fro from dice like I showed you twice. <laughs> it needs to be streamlined to one dice only for generating all the elements of a magic item. Uh, but other than that, and the fact that entombments need to be fleshed out, which I'm sure is coming, I have nothing to complain about as far as magic items go. It's nice, it's great. It's and it means very few changes. Uh, this is Cheese of Ages, signing off.